Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for the kind words and the pressure that you applied just there. Um, and also, thanks to the institution for inviting me here today to talk to you all. Um, it's great to be, I've been a member of the institution since I graduated, and it's great to be here at the Young Engineers Conference to see the energy in the room and to see and meet some of the next generation of engineers. So um, I've got quite a bit to go through today, uh, but my talk is kind of split into three parts. Um, and all around the topic of material science and structural engineering. The first part is about how I kind of embarked on the journey of having this deep interest in material science and its applications in structural engineering and how it's informed some of, my, some of my work. The second part is a kind of a deeper dive into that but with a digital and computational design overlay about a particular project. And the third part is about uh, looking to the future a little bit. So let's see if I have more luck with the uh, clicker than um, Elizabeth. So this is the start. It's about exploring materials in my early career. So I suppose early on in my career, um, and through, well, through my, starting through my education in early career, I was very excited, I suppose influenced by the work of the three gentlemen along the bottom, working from right to left, Pierre Luigi Nerve, then Ove Mequist Arup, and then Peter Rice. The two on the right hand side, I, I noticed on the board, are gold medal recipients. And what I was really interested about their work is that the approach that they took to structural engineering. And Nerve very much was about understanding the flow of forces in, in, in structures, and then tried to optimize the use of materials where you put the, uh, the, the material where it was needed based on the flow of forces. Ove then took th things a little bit further, and he was really looking at buildability, collaboration, constructability, and again about exploring uh, uh, you know, different ways of using fairly traditional materials. And then Peter, um, an absolute genius, but what he did was start looking at alternative materials, but also different uh, uh, computational analytical techniques so that we could optimize and get the best value out of, uh, out of the materials that we use. And I think for me, what, this, uh, what, what these did was it showed that you really needed to have a fundamental understanding of the science of the, um, of the material and the physics of the material, and it really drove a first principles approach to design. And what I got from that personally is it gave you a lot of freedom when you do it from first principles. Going beyond code, um, it gives you freedom to, to explore new avenues. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my projects, which where I did that, um, and, and different aspects of exploring materials uh, and design. It's Portcullis House um, in, in London. So the first part of this was uh, the concrete floor slabs. And you might think, well, how is that a new material? But a lot of the work is about how you use existing materials in, in kind of new and innovative ways. But what we looked at here was we had a grid of 13.6 uh, meters clear span and working with the architect Michael Hopkins who was also influenced by Nervi, he wanted to understand and try and create, use the minimum amount of material to get from A to B spanning 13.6 meters. So we looked at how we would do that and rather than kind of doing I suppose a traditional approach to design where you might design a slab and then optimize it and pull out a few millimeters here and there and reduce the amount of of rebar, we looked at it quite differently. We said, what are all the other things that the concrete needs to do? And what is the minimum amount to achieve those uh, particular goals? So when we looked at fire separation between floors, acoustic separation between floors, and everything else, we came up with a dimension of 125 millimeters was needed to, do, uh, to achieve that. So then we said, how can we get 125 millimeters of concrete to span 13.6 meters? And that's what we did. So even though this looks quite big, what we did was we created the form to create a lever arm between the tension and compression flanges that allows us to, to um, span 13.6 meters with 125 mil of concrete. And this is what we did. But actually to achieve these precast units was really working closely with the manufacturers um, to, and, and with the contractors to really understand, use a construction-led approach to the implementation of the precast. So that, to me, was really understanding the construction process, the material itself, and, um, and, and the, the on-site uh, construction. Another part of the, the project that we looked at, and this was we were in a World Heritage site with this particular building. We had to re replicate uh, the, the materials used in the surrounding area, and a lot of that was, was natural stone. And Hopkins, as an architect, they're very true to the materials. They don't, what you see is what you get. They really don't kind of hide things with, with, with cladding and, and finishes and everything else. So for the stone columns, they wanted to use natural stone columns. So here, this was an opportunity to learn from first principles about how a natural sandstone material works. There is no code really for this. There's some guidance in some of the masonry codes. There's some guidance from uh, 
places like the Institution of Structural Engineers where there's, where there's academic papers. But really, we were trying to use a natural stone in a, uh, you know, uh, in a modern environment and make it safe and robust. So we went through a process of understanding, uh, of testing the material to understand how it works. Really, we needed to understand how it was made. So we spent a lot of time with industry really using their knowledge to inform our design. And then together, we created something that was quite unique and quite special. Another component of um, what we did on the uh, Portcullis House was the bronze roof, aluminium bronze roof, was a bronze alloy. And here we chose to use bronze because a lot of the roofs in and around uh, Westminster have bronze finishes. But there was other reasons for it in terms of that bronze is a very durable material and in terms of a roof it would require little to no maintenance. But what was interesting for me about this particular material was that it had never really been used in the construction industry before but it had been used in other industries like the shipbuilding industry and the offshore industry. So what I thought was really interesting about that was the opportunity to transfer technology from one industry to another. And I think that's an opportunity for us going forward is about how we use technology transfer across a whole range of industries to inform what we do today and do things better. And again, um, for this particular thing, there was no codes of practice. There was no standard specifications. There was no standard details. There was no standard welding procedures. There was no standard bolted connections. So basically, we had a blank sheet of paper and a new material, and we created a design specification and drawings that could be built on site in the city of Westminster. And that's what we did. So it was an opportunity to really get down to the, the really literally the nuts and bolts of it and understand how things are done. A fantastic learning experience that um, I've used right throughout my career as I explore uh, materials from a, a, a first principles approach. Now you might say, well, this isn't a new material. It's timber, a beautiful material. But what we were trying to do here, this is the courtyard of Portcullis House, was to replicate, I suppose, a bit of homage to the Great Hall in the Palace of Westminster itself. So it was an interesting juxtaposition of the old and the new. So we were trying to do a modern interpretation of the timber roof in, in the Palace of Westminster. And here, uh, the architects wanted to use an American hardwood, which was a, a good material for what we were trying to achieve. But again, there was no uh, data about the, uh, the allowable stresses that we could use um, for, for American hardwood. So we actually, we collaborated with the American Hardwood Council to embark on a series of testing and research to understand how that material performs. Now, as a result of that, we, we achieved the design, but we also developed with the American Hardware Council a design guide so that information was available to others. So it was about giving back to industry as much as learning for ourselves. And I think that is something that is important. And if we we're try trying to address some of the challenges that Martin was putting to us earlier on, I think this idea um, of collaboration and the spirit of sharing knowledge and helping each other um, solve the, 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 the problems of today, I think, is, is hugely important. And in the end, we got what I think is a wonderful project, and see if we can get the, I don't know where the, which one is the, uh, the pointer? Oops. So the bronze roof on the top, you can see the natural stone columns uh, uh, in the vertical structure. They're uh, po uh, post-tensioned, and then you can see the nodes of the, the concrete elements coming out. So that was my first, I suppose, big experience of thinking a little bit differently and beyond code. And that quickly led on to this project, which is the Spire of Dublin, which is basically, it is a sculpture. It is a piece of art, and that, that's the way it was presented. So when you were speaking to the, to the architect and the client about a piece of art, the language changes quite considerably. So it was all about the finishes, the tolerances, and the finesse of what you touch and feel and see. But also, it's a big piece of complex engineering. I know it looks simple, a cantilever. You say, I'll have one of those every day of the week in the structures exam, it's easy. But it's 120 meters tall and it's three meters diameter at the bottom. So it's very, very slender. And it's 125 tons overall. But the issues that we had to uh, resolve from an engineering point of view was wind, dynamics, fatigue, damping, the whole lot. Not something that came up in the discussion with the architect or the, or the client. They didn't see this as, uh, as an issue. They just saw the art piece as what they wanted to achieve. But actually, to achieve the engineering, we needed to understand the physics of the material. How stainless steel, how, you know, what's the natural damping of it? How does it behave in, uh, in a fatigue situation? How does it behave in wind? But then to achieve the aesthetic of the piece, we really needed to understand the essence of the material itself. How it was made, how it was worked, how it was prepared, how it was fabricated, how it was put together. There was some guidance out there, but not a lot. 
But again, we use technology transfer because stainless steel is used a lot in the pharmaceutical and the food industry for high levels of polish and finish. So we got a lot of information from that industry to inform the finishes, and I'll go through that a little bit more. And we also had some technology transfer from the F1 industry. So that's quite interesting, the F1 industry informing the building construction industry, which is quite special. So we got back to really in first principles, understanding from when, how the material is rolled, how it is flattened and made, how it is curved, how it is polished and finished. And then um, this piece here is where we got the technology transfer from uh, the F1 industry. We shot peened um, the, 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 the spire as part of the finishes. But actually the shot peening work, work hard in the material as well. So it actually helped us in terms of the fatigue design that we were trying to undergo. And that, there was papers from the F1 industry that allowed us to make an informed decision about that particular approach. And the thing that came out of it at the end was, um, you know, it got a, lot of, it got, got a lot of press for all the right and wrong reasons. Um, it got a lot of debate amongst the people of Dublin and Ireland, and Dublin wit was at its best when they started coming up with various nicknames for the spire. But also at the end, it created a project that was quite beautiful. It was part of a city generation project. It kind of it, it, um, it endeared a, a, a lot of civic pride. The people of Dublin they might give it a nickname, but that means it's got a place in their heart. So it really garnered uh, some civic pride. It created joy and delight. The feedback we got from the, from the people of Dublin was fantastic. You know, people coming up to say, thank you for creating this wonderful piece. So we, there was a piece earlier on about how, I think one of the discussion points is, how do we give profile to engineers for things other than a disaster? Things like this, when we do it properly, um, give us that opportunity to, 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 to raise our profile. But also the knowledge sharing. Some of the research that we did to deliver this project has been, it was published in the iStruct or the Structural Engineers Journal. It's been used in projects around the world since. So they were the two of the big sort of projects that I was really got my interest going about materials. And then that quickly moved to a whole pile of projects. And this is one that we did in Milan. And the material here that was quite of interest was a woven fabric that we created through fiber optics and stainless steel wire to create this kind of light canvas that could be part of a piece of art and sculpture. This is one that um, I did with the, the architect that came second in the Spire of Dublin competition. This came up a little bit after, and he said, okay, you won it the last time. Maybe if I team with you, I might be first this time. And we didn't win it. And, but this was a 100-meter tall uh, recycled glass tower in a seismic area. So maybe coming first was a, <laughs> a blessing in disguise for us. Very, very complex piece of work. And then this is more recent. It's a piece of sculpture in, uh, in Seattle called Wawona. Um, it is a piece of art. What was interesting here is about upcycling. So th all the materials from this was from a, a schooner that was rotting in, uh, in South Lake Union in, in Washington. And the, the museum, the local museum, was, was part of their exhibit. They were going to get rid of it. And an artist said, no, I've got an idea. And it was an idea to kind of recreate kind of the, an image of the hull of the schooner. Um, in, as a piece of art, and he, he worked with us to do that. But to achieve it, we really had to understand a material that was about 300 years old, how it had decayed um, after so many years rotting away in the water, what the uh, material strengths were like. So we worked with a lot of ac academic researchers um, to, to understand that. And then when we got into kind of creating the piece itself, we, it was really design and fabrication, or digital design to fabrication process, where we designed with the artist all the, the features on the outside, and that went straight to a five-axis CNC machine to create it. So it was direct from our analysis and design software straight into the uh, software of the, uh, of the fabricator, and a beautiful piece. So that's a little bit about my journey. And uh, it came, I suppose, culminated a couple of years ago, and this is one of the projects I think that Elizabeth was talking about at the start. And this is a, a project called Impatient Optimist. And what I'm going to talk about here is about how we mirrored um, an ancient handcraft with a new language of engineering. And I'll take you through that right now. So we had just completed this project in Seattle, and it's the new headquarter building for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's a campus, it's a city center campus consisting of three uh, projects and a wonderful plaza in the middle. And this is Melinda on the right. And... Um, they, herself and Bill, call each other the impatient optimists. They're very optimistic about the change that can be made to better the lives of many people around the world, and they just feel they cannot do it quickly enough. But Melinda uh, was very interested in the art of this woman called Janet Eckelman um, from uh, uh, Boston. And Janet was a Fulbright scholar uh, who uh, uh, 
went to India to study art. And she was really intrigued by the fishing nets of the local fishermen. And when they finished the day's work, um, fishing on, on the seas, they used to come out and dry and repair their nets. And what she really liked is this kind of space that those things created. Um, they created a kind of a, a transparent space where the, the workers would talk, eat, fix their nets, but it was their own little environment, but it was open for everybody else to see what was going on. She also liked the way that it, it, it blew in the wind. And this, was, this is part of her artwork. She's been doing this kind of theme of stuff for many, many years. Melinda wanted one, liked it, and wanted one for the campus. So basically, um, the commission was to create this piece of sculpture hanging over the public plaza in this beautiful campus that we, uh, we spent many, many years working on using a palace of materials that looked like this, rope and wire. <clears throat> and then just to add to that, the, uh, the illusion that was sold to the... Uh, to Melinda by Janet was this beautiful um, net that floated in the breeze and changed color with different lighting. And then there was this little video, if I can get it to work, let's see, does that work? So this is the effect of it kind of blowing quite gently. So wonderful vision um, developed through computer software, sold to a very influential woman, Melinda Gates. And just to remind you, this was the palace of materials that we had at our disposal. And then we had a couple of stuff that we could test a little bit more. You know, there was uh, from the, the sailing industry to bind some of the ropes together and connect them. But this is how it's made. I mean, these are the guys that made this. Their main business is making fishing nets. That's what they do. But it was that ancient handcraft of making fishing nets is actually what's instrumental in Janet Eichelman achieving her pieces of art. It's very, very basic. So this is what we had. We broke the structure of the sculpture down into two main components. We had what we call the hard net, or the structural net, which is the piece spanning between the buildings. And then we had the sculptural, the soft net, which was uh, uh, hanging beneath it and, and, and flowing um, and hanging over the, the, pl the public plaza. The geometry is quite complex. The materials are quite complex. The dominant loads on this is wind and snow and ice. So we thought, how do we approach this? Bearing in mind how it was made, how do we approach the design? And then once we design it, how do we pass on that information to the people in the workshop to make it? So it was really coming together complex analysis, communication of design, and implementation of the outcome. So jumping ahead a little bit, this is what we did. We kind of digitized the hell out of it, really. We kind of automated as much stuff as we could. And the reason we automated it, not just because we could, because it's actually what made sense. It was the right thing to do. But by automating a lot of the complexity and a lot of the really iterative sort of stuff, it gave us time to think how we would actually prepare the materials for the people to make it. It would allow us to focus on the things that added real value to the overall piece. So the pieces in orange are the kind of the main sort of uh, tools that we use to drive the input and the output. And the blue is what we got as a result of all that. So a complex workflow map that was created by a brilliant engineer um, from my team in, in Seattle, a guy called Clayton Binkley, absolutely amazing guy. But the whole idea was really to try and take this digital environment, get it to fabrication in a way that uh, could be understood by um, the workmen. So as part of one of the big things that a lot of the software was already there. Um, there's the one of us created this Maya uh, toolkit for Janet Eichelman to put her stuff in there. Revit obviously was available. And GSA is the stru structural software that Arab used. It's in-house software that we use that is available if you want to buy it. Um, but the Rhino plugin is actually what connected the whole lot together and actually allowed us to do things like the wind loads, uh, free stress, uh, form finding, and everything else. So this is what the Rhino plugin did. It was a dynamic in-house uh, uh, scripted dynamic relaxation solver. It allowed us to do the form finding for the, uh, for the net, applying pre-stress and modifying and generating the geometry as a result of pre-stress, and then smoothing out the pre-stress. And this was an iterative process, because every time the geometry changed, we had to you know, go full circle with, with the artist to make sure it was in line with what they wanted to do. Once we had that, then we were looking at all the, the wind loads, the, uh, uh, the ice load analysis, 
and then finally the documentation. So this is really a complex 3D piece of structure and we created tools within the Rhino script to unroll every single piece of it so it became a 2D image like a, a pattern that you'd make clothing out of and that was our aim and that was the way we felt we could document um, and communicate the design to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the workers. So this is kind of the script and the plugin in action. Um, not going to go through it. Um, but the, this is a little bit, and I'm just going to touch on this a, li a little bit more, where you know, we try and understand the physics of the material and the physics of, of behavior in, in external environments. A net in wind behaves quite differently than, say, a building. So there's very little stuff out there as to how we would approach it. So we spent a lot of time looking at the impact of wind on the knots, the ropes, when it drifts and shields, um, one part of the net shields another part of the net, what's the change in loads, there's dynamic effects that we needed to, to, to come in, uh, into it, but there's thousands and thousands of elements that each behave differently, and that's what the script allowed us to do. The Rhino um, script allowed us to really iterate through that really, really quickly. But what was interesting, the research that allowed us to kind of progress it um, uh, most in the most optimal way was research actually that was done in the fishing industry in Norway where they actually put fishing nets in tanks of saline water and put a flow through them so you could see how the, the fluid interaction with the net and it was the principles of that that we applied to reduce the wind loads that one might ordinarily expect if you take you know a straight interpretation of a current code so actually again technology transfer from <laughs> the fishing industry <laughs> to, uh, to the building uh, industry allowed us to achieve something quite beautiful so in the end, we got this, and this is the, uh, the analytical representation of the final model, but then how we um, uh, portray that information back to the, uh, to the, to the workers. Because this is how they make it. They lay out pieces of rope on the floor. They get a tape and they measure it, and then they cut it and splice it, and that's what they do. They don't use spreadsheets. They definitely don't use Rhino. So we had, it was really important how we um, portrayed that information. Also, we have to get in things like tolerances, connections, and everything else. And then, as I said at the start, there was a piece about difference of color. This is one of the nets being made with different, with different color palettes through the net. How, again, do we portray that information? And this was not going to be the approach. We ideally wanted to give them the Rhino file, but that wasn't going to work. So what we did was we, as I said, the plugin un unfurled all the nets and created a 2D pattern. And this is one of the drawings on the left-hand side that we created that basically unfurled a piece of net. And on that, I did the automatically generated the type of rope, the length of the rope, the call out for the connection, and they put it on the wall, as you see on the right-hand side, and that's how they made it. And then to go on to a little bit of further detail for the, for the longer structural ropes, we again uh, called out where the connections of this soft net were hanging, and they could measure them out as a, just a linear dimension um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the floor. And that's the, some of the details um, we did for the, uh, for the connections. So to add to that, this is um, one of the pieces of uh, output from Janet's software, the Maya uh, plugin that was developed by Autodesk for her. And this is where she's beginning to look at the different uh, colors of rope and twine that were used throughout the structure. So we had, again, this overlay of new information onto the particular, um, uh, on, onto the sculpture itself. So we created a kind of a, a, a pattern like this. And what's, you could say the top piece, that doesn't really represent uh, the sculpture. And you're right, it doesn't. But what it did was about the adjacencies of the color palettes. That's what was important in this particular drawing. But what is also kind of scary, I suppose, and intriguing is that because this kind of creates the adjacent panels and how they have to connect them together in terms of color, because it's a 3D thing, you never really see, there's no visual check that can happen along the way to make sure it's right. The first check you get that everything is in the right place is when it's built. No shop drawings, you know, nothing, you know, you never see it in its 3D form to check it. So that is actually quite scary. Um, if you were to transfer that to a traditional sort of building. But it also talks about the relationship of trust. I think that's important when you stretch the boundaries of technology and what we can do. So that the trust between the people making it, the arts and ourselves, was actually hugely essential to achieve what we did. So again, to help that, we kind of created the panels of different color, and that came straight out of our, of our piece, out of our, our Rhino model. But when you do it properly, you do create a thing of beauty. And this is the final piece, but it was developed from all those like 2D drawings um, 
and, and information that we gave to, to, the, to the makers of the net. And then when you get feedback like that from your clients, you think, okay, I've done something right, and maybe inspire them along the way. And this is a quote from O from the key speech, which I think is important. Um, and when I when we talk about, you know, he says, to strive for quality in only a part is almost useless if the, if the whole is undistinguished. When I think about that project, I think it is a beautiful thing. But actually, when I think about quality, I think it, it, the quality comes out in, I think, three main components. I think the quality of the relationship right across the client and design and construction team, the, the quality of that relationship allowed us to achieve what we did. Without that relationship, I think we wouldn't have got to where we wanted to do because it was a, a real um, trust and respect for the different skills that people could bring to the project, down to the people that were kind of knitting and sewing these nets. Without them and understanding how to put it together, this couldn't be achieved. I think the quality of the documentation um, that, that, that we knew worked from a, a structural point of view, but the makers could uh, read it from the making point of view. I think the quality of that, that spoke to both our needs, was important. And I think the quality of the outcome speaks for itself. So that's a, that was a kind of a, a where materi new materials, and we had to, there's a, probably a much longer talk about the research we had to do into understanding the, 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 uh, the, the allowable stresses within the ropes, the synthetic ropes, the natural fiber ropes, and everything else. But there, that was a materials research, understanding fabrication with a digital overlay. So it's the, a lot of the themes of, of the conference all coming together in one particular project. But now I want to talk about what's next. Um, I call it design research and delight. And, the work that we did on that particular project with, with Janet, um, that has since uh, developed into bigger, larger scale, um, similar sort of sculptures. This is one in, in Boston um, over a, um, a huge park, um, creating quite a spectacular piece of public art that people can enjoy. This is a project that one of my colleagues in Arab did uh, quite recently, and you might have seen it at the, um, the uh, architectural festival in London a couple of years ago called The Smile. Now, what I was interested about this is, 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 is a couple of things. One is it's, it's CLT, which is a, a material I think we need to explore. But actually, it's, it's tulip wood. And actually, this is an extension of the collaboration and the research that we did with the American Hardwood Council back on Port Cullis House back in the early 2000s. And the research um, for the tulip wood was an extension of that. So it's a 15 to 20 year kind of research uh, collaboration together. So these collaborations between practitioners academics, researchers, whatever it might be, I think is really important if we're to drive um, forward new materials, new ways of looking at materials and really understanding their behavior. I think as well, this one I just think is a fun piece of, a piece of, of architecture and design uh, done by uh, the, the, the AA team. And what's really fun about this is they've got this chainsaw on steroids that just kind of cuts the hell out of these trees. But what I found really quite interesting about it as well was that, you know, sometimes we overlook um, um, valid pieces of structure, valid materials that can be used in a structural thing because they mightn't look like normal. But what is normal? So the structural stuff here is done from basically trees, branches of trees. We did that hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But along the way, we said, no, everything has to be bright, shiny, and new. And we've left some of this stuff behind. And I think there's a place for some of this. And I think we shouldn't, we need to put aside perhaps some of our biases and prejudices when we look at materials and rethink them and how we can use them appropriately. But actually, I think there's a more serious reason why we need to continue our research into material and alternative ways of doing things. And you, you'll all have seen, I'm sure, the UN SDGs, uh, which is important in terms of the outcomes for a planet, what we need to do for society and make up for, for a sustainable future. Martin earlier on talked about the declaration um, of the structural engineers made about climate and, and uh, biodiversity emergency. That is real. It's happening now. Uh, we have, we're running out of time to do something about it. And then two weeks ago in the, um, the structural engineer, the journal of the ISTRECT-D, there's this letter by David Knight saying, it's time to do something about the climate emergency that we live in. And actually, if you look at the declaration, I think it's really exciting. And you might say it's an emergency. Why are you so excited about it? But again, it's an opportunity for us as structural engineers, designers, researchers, practitioners to make a difference in the world that we live in. And if you read, I, I would urge you to read the, um, the declaration and the things that we said we're going to do. There's a place in that for every single one of us to make a difference. So let's go do it. 
and that that research, I think, you know, we um, this is some work I did when I was when I was working in the states, and this is about CLT shear walls. You know, CLT and timber are seen as a, a you know a, 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 a sustainable material, low carbon impact, but we don't know enough about it, especially in regions of high seismicity. So we did a lot of work on CLT shear walls, but what I find interesting about this is not just the research itself, but the people that were involved. It really does take a village. You know, no one can do it on their own. So this opening up, being open about collaboration and research and doing it together allows us to kind of um, chart these uh, uh, uncharted territory to date, and I think we need to do it. And you know, this was absolutely leading cutting edge research that was done not that long ago, and these technologies are now being used in buildings. So I think actually with digital tools and computation, we can actually iterate much more quickly stuff that years ago might have taken us a, a lot longer to develop. So like from uh, testing and research to implementation, that time spans a lot shorter now. And this is a similar piece of research that we did on an alternative lateral system in the regions of high seismicity, which is a bucking restrained brace. So here we are looking at a heavy timber BRB, which is looking at technologies, BRBs is a well-known uh, technology in areas of high seismicity but not with, um, a, 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 with heavy timber. So we were bringing um, two technologies together to see if it could lead us to a new way of doing things. And the research goes on. There's fire engineering and acoustic engineering that need to be done if we're to look at timber as a viable material, but together we can do it. This piece of research was funded by the United States Department of Agriculture because they were trying to create business and a new economy for the, the foresters by promoting timber as a viable construction material the fellow was sustainable, but they knew that to be viable, they needed to address all these things. So there's good social and economic reasons for doing these things as well. And then, you know, I look around Arab and I continue to be inspired by some of the amazing people that we've got. So this is a friend of mine, uh, Matthew Vola from our Amsterdam office that did this amazing project, which was he was exploring with uh, MX3D, the 3D printing of steel bridges. And again, um, this is some of the analysis that was done, but again, uh, computers and, uh, and the software that we have today allow us to optimize these things very, very to a fine degree and just putting material where we need it and it does the work. But that wasn't done in isolation. This, some of this uh, analysis was done jointly with the Imperial College out of London. So our research crosses the boundaries and that will continue to happen regardless of what happens on October 31st. And this is it, uh, the final piece. Now let's see if this piece works. I think this is a, let's see. So this is the actual process. But you know, these things look easy, but the, the stuff that behind all this is huge. I mean, there was unknown material properties when you're printing 3D material. How do you understand things like tolerances in this sort of environment? How do you deal with geometric inaccuracies and imperfections in this sort of environment? In a 3D printed metal, what is the microstructure behavior of that steel material? What are the residual stresses and how does it impact your design? How do you deal with welding defects? So, but together we can solve all these things and create things that are quite beautiful, quite stunning, and allow us to progress our industry and move it forward. beautiful. Sorry, I should, you know, the, the, I cut that off too soon, but there was about a half a dozen people listed there, the collaborators and that. So again, it does take a village to chart new waters, but it's worth doing. So this is the finished piece, and that's the finished piece in place. Absolutely beautiful. But not to be outdone, uh, one of my friends in Milan, uh, Lucas Di Bile, um, looked at printing concrete. So this is a 3D um, a house that was printed in Milan for an architectural exhibition. And I'll look at some of the details in a moment. But um, each, there's 35 concrete modules that make up this house, and each of the modules took about 60 minutes to 3D print, which is pretty impressive. And then assembled together to create the house. We did a lot of, uh, you know, it's concrete, it's unreinforced concrete. Um, so there was, you know, approaching concrete in a different way and how it behaves and performs is uh, it took a little bit of, of thinking about. 
um, how it's built, what the 3D printing process has on how the, the material cures over time was things that were unknown territory. So you had to figure all that out. So there is a place, uh, you know, as engineers, there's a lot for us to do. Computational tools allow us to iterate through that a lot more quickly. And this is what it looks like in the inside, quite beautiful. And this is a little piece of it going through. What I find interesting about this is, you know, it's a, it's a 3D automated printing process, but there's still a man and machine sort of engagement, you know. If you look at the guy beside the machine, there's still that bit of handcraft that's going into making this automated process. So again, a lot of people have helped to achieve that. Um, and you know, 10 years ago, this wouldn't really have been possible, but um, now it is, and, and technology is changing so quickly. But it, you know, it is a critical time for the planet. And I think um, as engineers and designers, you know, we have a huge responsibility, but also a huge opportunity to make a difference. I think there is significant work for us to do. And a, as an industry, I think we need to harness our collective skills, our expertise, and our in, in, intellect to create structural engineering outcomes that have a more positive Im impact on the world around us. I think with an improved understanding of materials, old and new materials, coupled with digital technologies, automation, machine learning, I think we're at a fairly unique point in history, but I think that gives us the opportunity to make a difference and solve the problems that face the planet today. I think optimization and rapid prototyping, both real and virtual, allow us to explore and understand the impact of our designs in a way that we have not been able to do before. So I urge you to take the opportunity to do something different. Explore, create, solve the problems of the planet because it's, it's in our interest to do so, but it's, it's in our gift because we have the knowledge and expertise. I think open up your minds and your hearts and collaborate with this immense talent and skill that's around the planet, and then we can do something quite unique. I think if we do it well, we can create things of beauty, of elegance. And I think along the way, if we do it properly, we can also inspire others. Now, this is a quote from our, our, our client, Lynn Perkins, an amazing woman. But she said, thanks for letting me play a while in your sandbox when we were making this piece of um, art. So even though we were kind of exploring material science, complex digital tools, she felt that she was part of the journey from start to finish. She felt that as engineers, as designers, we kept her informed, we could com communicate with her in a way that was important for her to talk to Melinda. And I think that's part of our responsibility as well, to inspire and inform others so we can make a difference. So that's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, and uh, that's it. <clears throat>